precision medicine in the general case is medicine that is personalized to individual patients, or at least cohorts of patients that are very similar. We've learned over the last couple of decades that human beings are very different. There's great heterogeneity, even if they have the same disease, there's great heterogeneity in it. It's based on their genetic makeup, also their lifestyle, and their environment. All three of those factors can change how an individual patient will respond to a treatment and even the extent and rate of the progression of their disease. Hey, you're gonna love this interview with Dr. D. Lansing Taylor. He is a world-renowned expert in the realms of computational and systems biology. He is the director of the Drug Discovery Institute at the University of Pittsburgh, and he has founded a string of successful biotech startups. We talk in this conversation about precision medicine, the way he thinks the future of diagnostics will work in a clinical environment, and a whole lot more. Stay with us. So Lance, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm excited to be talking with you. Happy to talk about precision medicine. I am really excited because this is something that, you know, you, you bounce around the startup scene enough. You see that as one of the buzzwords that it can be an investment thesis. It can be, you know, the, the story that a startup is trying to tell about themselves. But what's interesting to me is, you know, in, in startups generally, there's folks that kind of, they're trying to catch the wave. They like see that that's a thing and then they go chase it. And my perception of you is that this is something that has really kind of captured your intellectual interest for quite some time. So can you talk a little bit about what precision mes medicine is for folks that aren't interested and why it has been such a interest to you? So precision medicine in the general case is medicine that is personalized to individual patients or at least cohorts of patients that are very similar. We've learned over the last couple of decades that Human beings are very different. There's great heterogeneity. Even if they have the same disease, there's great heterogeneity. And it has, uh, it's based on their uh, genetic makeup, also their lifestyle, and their environment. All three of those factors can change how an individual patient will respond to a treatment and even the extent and rate of the progression of their disease. And so when did you come to this realization that this was such a big opportunity and something you wanted to pursue as a career? Well, it actually goes back probably 20 years or more when uh, we were developing uh, platforms for drug discovery. And 20, 25 years ago, the major pharmaceutical companies had very simple assays when they were testing their libraries of new compounds to find a compound that would, might have an impact on a disease. And in these overly simplified assays, they were averaging, in cell-based assays, averaging the signal from maybe a thousand cells from a well within a plate. And what we did was to look at this and ask the question, are all of these cells, even though they're the, quote, same cell type, do they respond the same to various treatments? And the answer was a dramatic, no, there's great heterogeneity, even at the cellular level, that has to be based on genetic makeup, state of uh, the, cell, the cell state, as they call it, where it is in its cell cycle, as well as what kind of treatments it's receiving. So the concept of heterogeneity uh, triggered this, at least in uh, me and my colleagues, 20, 25 years ago, just based on understanding heterogeneity at the level of uh, cell assays. And so another thing that you see with different kind of technological cycles is there, there can be periods of extreme excitement and there can be periods of, you know, winters. People say there's a, an AI winter, a crypto winter, a, a winter t with whatever technology as people maybe uh, come to realize that the current uh, environment or the universe of capabilities is somewhat more constrained than what the original excitement uh, suggested. So can you talk a little bit about where you think, th think things stand right now? So this has been the history, especially in biotechnology. A new technology comes along, uh, new methods that have great potential, 
and they're usually overhyped yeah. uh, by the scientists out of enthusiasm, certainly investors who want to uh, take advantage of a rising wave in a new area and be first. Uh, in reality, most of the important technologies take some time to evolve and be refined to the point where they can have a major impact. The timeline, sadly, is usually longer than we'd like it to be. So uh, we, we, as a field, haven't done a good job of managing expectations. So we don't go through cycles of summer and winter in different areas. I think with more management of uh, how long it's going to take, but the impact it will have would uh, serve the field better. But are there other underlying techn technological factors like advances in computing, um, advances in, you know, the, the Human Genome Project was now how many decades ago yeah. to just basically have the tools at our disposal to actually make meaningful progress the same way that, you know, the, the first website for like cat and dog supplies is yes. uh, poultry comparison to like Chewy.com today. Right. So I think one of the things that we've learned, especially over the last decade, is the complexity in humans and their diseases is such that uh, single technologies will not be uh, the, uh, ma the major answer on their own. So genomics was a major factor over the last 10, 20 years. And we thought early on that if we knew the whole genome and had individual uh, genomics on patients, we could identify most of what we needed to know. And the answer is that's only part of the story. Again, uh, the genetics of a patient, uh, their lifestyle, and their environment have equal impact on how a patient is going to progress with a di given disease and how they'll respond to treatment. So more technologies were required. A lot of it has required advanced computing. And I think we're there now with computing power that's needed. We needed to look at uh, more than just uh, the genomics. Uh, we needed to understand the microbiome uh, that is playing an important role. We needed to understand a pathology, uh, which enables investigators to look at the spatial relationships between cells in a particular tissue, how they communicate, and the population of whether it's immune cells or cancer cells or other, quote, stromal cells, uh, how they create microdomains and talk to one another, uh, creating an evolution of uh, the disease. All of these factors, I think, are now well within sight. Uh, I won't say there won't be more important uh, advances, but we have a pretty good arsenal now to do real precision medicine. And is there also a degree to which, you know, this is something that I don't have a lot of personal experience with, but I've heard enough stories of, you know, well, in the academic institution, there's this really interesting cutting edge research and, and experimentation going on. And then if you, you know, turn your gaze all the way over to like the practical, you know, what are doctors doing with patients yeah. right now in the present, this kind of yawning gap between it, because you have to extract it from the academy, you have to process it and systematize it. Um, what does that look like from your purview? So that's one of the things that we've tried to implement at the University of Pittsburgh within the Drug Discovery Institute, where we're sitting. Yeah. Uh, and that is there has to be fun fundamental research on a particular disease uh, and to gain more knowledge. But at the same time, there has to be new technologies developed. But importantly, it has to be driven by what the clinicians need. Uh, and then it has to be uh, translated from the academic laboratory into a commercial setting where things actually can be produced. And so we've put a major effort into not only uh, investigating diseases at the academic basic research level, but creating technologies and spinning them off so that they can have an impact uh, for the public. Um, how do you tell when the technology is ready to be spun off? When, is it, when does it have enough meat on the bone to go really pursue? Yeah, that, that's an important question, and it, it varies. Uh, I'll give you just a quick uh, uh, story about one of our earlier technologies, which was high-content screening. Uh, this is the technology where we build an instrument, reagents, and analytics to study cells, 
as a better model for drug discovery than uh, was used at the time, which were mostly enzyme assays in solutions. So you had no uh, components of life. You had uh, individual components. Um, We thought that would uh, revolutionize drug discovery. But at the time, and this was in the middle 90s, the pharmaceutical industry, which of course would be driving advances in drug discovery technologies, were caught up in what they called ultra-high throughput screening. This is uh, doing assays that we considered not very good, but much faster. (laughs) So they could get through huge libraries to find molecules they could pursue. So there was a lag period between the time that we introduced the platform that could really have an impact and when the uptake began. And the industry had to learn that they were continuing to fail in getting new therapeutics approved by using the traditional methods. So it took kind of an extra three years beyond where we thought it would have an impact. It finally came off the toe of the curve and now high content screening is a standard component of of uh, drug discovery. I So, I mean, we have a marketing company, so I'm, I'm kind of talking my own book here, but I always, when I hear stories like that, I always think about, uh, you know, the, the, the precise opposite of the, if you build it, they will come yes. ethos, which is, yes, eventually they came to it and it took a while, but I'm sure there was a lot of painful communication that oh. needed to happen. And if that could have been expedited, think about, you know, the potential impact. It, it was very painful, but the good news was in, during that period, which was kind of in the middle of the human genome project, yeah. there was a lot of fluff. This was before the... Uh, uh, IT bubble and the biotech bubble burst uh, in, in 99 or 2000. So there was plenty of money to fund this research and the early commercial activities, even though there would be a lag. It was the promise of what we could do with cells, doing the same thing to cells as had been done in the genome, really understanding uh, that uh, uh, complexity. Actually, the name of the company back then was Solomix. It's now part of Thermo Fisher. Uh, but that's why with uh, the one of the spinoffs, Spintelex, which is the precision pathology company, we have been very careful. We formed it almost four years ago, but we've been funding it through grants and a small amount of dilutive funding because the market wasn't well-defined three to four years ago. Uh, was very novel applying uh, advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence to pathology uh, images. So uh, we kept our powder dry, if you will. That's become even more important now because we're not in the middle of a thro- uh, uh, a frothy market in biotech today. Things have slowed down because of the overall economic uh, malaise. So uh, we are in a much better position to move forward because we haven't uh, uh, spent a lot of money but still have a long distance to run. So I'd love to unpack that more. And, and what it kind of brings to mind is the say, uh, another idiom, but what got you here won't get you there. And there's kind of one model that, you know, folks that are that are in the earlier stages of, you know, building or trying to get themselves started, it's it's a kind of do whatever it takes. Maybe you only have one path, but you take that path and you go as hard as you can into it because you're you're looking to, you know, not your first win, so to speak. You're on to your, you know, fifth and sixth startups. You've had multiple uh, sales and acquisitions of past ones. So not to say that that money is just of no concern whatsoever, but you have options and you have the experience of taking some of those paths that now it gets to inform the way you would think about a cap- capital structure of a business. So can you just get into a little bit more detail of the early stages of a company like that and and how you come to see the board in terms of, are you optimizing for optionality? Are you optimizing for patience? Like what are you really trying to maintain and protect that maybe you didn't have the same appreciation for earlier in your career? So I think the Focus on what is best for the patient ultimately will be best for the company. So putting the patient first is not an aside. It's very important. So in the case of of, uh, precision pathology, for example, uh, it, it is clear that 
the heterogeneity in patients goes all the way down to their cells and their distributions within tissues that are diseased. And understanding the spatial environment that all of these different kinds of cells find themselves in, in, for example, in a tumor, uh, really tells a story about the probable evolution of that cancer within that patient. And so f what we know now is, especially in solid tumors, we don't have a great track record. We can find drugs that have an effect for a while, but then uh, the, uh, the cancer cells are pretty smart. They respond. They change relative to the treatments they're getting or their environment. Uh, the immune system responds and alters what's happening. And so even you have a starting point with a patient of great heterogeneity, then you treat it in different ways and it continues to evolve. So understanding the complete environment, the spatial relationships between all the major players, from the cancer cells themselves, the immune system and their infiltration into the tumor, as well as the other support cells, generally called stromal cells, is crucial to understanding and predicting the direction of the disease progression. If you can predict where you think it's going to go from that knowledge, then you can jump ahead and have new treatments that you predict will be needed with the evolution for that individual patient. So, so I'm very careful because I, I know that I'm starting to tread towards the boundaries of, of my understanding here, but uh, to, to, to maybe try to say it another way and you can build off of, of what I'm offering you here. Um, people have heard maybe if, if they kind of pay attention to this idea of an artificial intelligence artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, system accompanying a human to get a better result. Uh, if it's talked about in medicine, one of the most common uh, applications is an x-ray. And, you know, you, instead of just the technician looking at the uh, x-ray with their eyes, you have, you know, a computer vision model that's being applied to that and maybe picking up things that otherwise wouldn't be seen. In your case, when you're talking about the uh, spatial nature of this tumor, it's looking at where the tumor is located, the size of it, the structure of it in some way, shape or form, and picking up things that would otherwise not be consistently diagnosed or acknowledged by the human eye. And that's really the essence of the technology that you're building and selling. Am I, am I saying that relatively that's, correctly? That's correct. With Spintelex, uh, we uh, know that the complexity within a tumor and the surrounding tissue in the tumor uh, is altered. Uh, and it varies in space and time. So a pathologist looking at a slide uh, uh, can make some important uh, determinations but some of the subtleties are so significant that uh, the pathologist would have to look at the same patient samples for a long time in order to make an optimal call. With the help of machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, that uh, job could be made much easier and more predictive. And uh, there have been studies now to show that adding machine learning and artificial intelligence improves the performance of the pathologists. And that's really also the essence of not just saying, okay, we're offloading all of that to the the. Uh, computer model, it's working in tandem, working in union, where maybe that elevates these you know, potential issues, and then it's, yeah, actually, that is something that I otherwise would have And the missed. pathologist is still in control. Uh, the uh, computational and systems biology analytics tell the, uh, the pathologist what they should be looking for, and you might have missed this, and then they make a call, calling it what they believe it is, the algorithms, that is, and then the pathologist can make the final decision. There's another com important element, and that is historically artificial intelligence has been what you call black box. In other words, the algorithms make a decision, and that's the answer. And the pathologist, or whatever field it's in, they have to accept it or not. Uh, what Spintelex has done is to introduce uh, explainable artificial intelligence. So not only does the algorithm make a call on what is uh, present in that patient sample, but it gives in pathologist terms why it made that decision. So now it becomes a partner of the pathologist rather than an alternative to the pathologist. And so you talked about kind of being relatively conservative with your capital structure 
uh, partially on the basis of still finding its market, if, I, if I'm, I'm saying that correctly. Can you get into more detail then? Because when you say that, I'm like, man, that sounds exceptionally exciting. I would hope that you know most of the people that would be treating me or my family would have access to something like that. What is, what is the gap or what is the, the hill to be climbed? So four years ago, <clears throat> we and lots of people recognized that uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence could have a big impact in pathology the way it had in uh, radiology and other fields. Uh, there were two things uh, fighting against it. One, pathologists hist historically have been the most conservative in not wanting to give, a, up, give it up any control in terms of decision making. So uh, the other uh, thing was what, what were the exact applications where these early tools could be applied? Was it in drug discovery? Was it in uh, a patient clinical trial selection? Was it in uh, making determinants of the optimal uh, therapeutic strategy for a patient? It was not clear. And so that's why we focused on research grants to kind of continue building the technology, filing patents to protect this new space of uh, uh, advanced spatial analytics and explainable AI, while also uh, doing market research. Where did the pharmaceutical industry see this technology going? Where did patho practicing pathologists see where it could have an impact and learn from that and then set a strategic plan for uh, the business. And that took a couple of years. Uh, COVID didn't help. Uh, we did a lot of Zoom calls rather than sitting down with people. Uh, but it became clear. Uh, we didn't have to spend millions of dollars evolving the company down an optimal path. We were able to see what the path was uh, while expending only a small amount of dilutive uh, funding money and then start accelerating. Beautiful. So in the meantime, you started another company, Biosystics, which is uh, the original, I saw a, a piece of media about it and I reached out to you because I thought it was a really fascinating idea of creating a, a digital twin of a patient. So part of the reason that this jumped out to me is a past guest of the show, Aaron Morris, uh, has created a company, All Vision, which creates a digital twin of a city. So that considerations, you know, like the, the sewage and other infrastructure can be kind of maintained, understood and, and planned for uh, in a more accessible way. Um, with that very little bit of preamble, can you talk about specifically this application to patient care? Sure. So uh, digital twins is a technology uh, and a concept that's been around for 20, 25 years. It started with industries such as the uh, aeronaut aeronautics industry, especially rockets, where it's too expensive to do experiments by saying, well, if we increase the power on this thruster by 20%, <clears throat> excuse me, what does that do to the, uh, to the direction of the rocket? So it became obvious that if you know all of these parameters, build a computational model, you can say, well, I'm gonna increase the thrust by 25%, change the angle by five degrees, and I can predict where it'll go. And after you've done iterative studies like that, you can then run an experiment. But it's only one or two experiments versus hundreds, which would not be practical. So for patients, it's very similar, uh, but even more dramatic in that we can't do experiments on the actual patient. Uh, but it's now unethical, unethical too, it's sure. unethical, <laughs> although in uh, cancer treatments, historically, it was more of a trial and error approach with drugs that have been uh, shown to be safe enough to give to a cancer patient. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't clear who would respond to what. And it was an experiment, if you will. But now we have so much data that we can get from patients from their whole genome uh, to uh, data from wearables, uh, to the whole electronic health record of that patient. Now, with precision pathology, we can get deeper knowledge of the details of heterogeneity uh, within a patient. Uh, and uh, the microbiome, all of this massive data is sitting there and available, and all of that data is going to have an impact on how that patient is going to respond to a treatment 
and even the progression of that disease if it's left untreated. So the data is all there. We have the computational power to manage and bring that uh, data together. Uh, that's not giving credit to the uh, uh, challenge in bringing diverse types of data together. Yeah. But then you can, if you do that, then you can computationally model that data and that patient, just like a rocket. You can say, given all of this data about that one patient, uh, let's say they have cancer, uh, uh, the data suggests that we should try drug X first, given its characteristics. Um, and now you can run that model and ask, what is the probability that that drug will have a positive impact on that patient? So you can use the computational model or the digital twin to predict what, how the patient will uh, respond. Even more powerfully, in the intervening you know, uh, last five, six, seven years, we now can make what I call a patient biomimetic twins, which are organs on chips, which can be cells derived from an individual patient, especially stem cells. We can build a, a copy of their liver, their heart, their brain, their kidneys in microfluidic chips based on cells from that patient. And so we can actually do some experiments on their liver, quote unquote, in the chip to add to the predictive power of the data from the patient themselves. So this integration, we think, is the future of precision medicine. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like a very big idea. I want to stick on microfluidic chip. That's not a term I've ever heard before. Can you explain what that is and how it works? So about a, deco, a decade ago, uh, the Department of Defense and the NIH started a program which was pie in the sky uh, to see could you build individual human organs on chips and even couple them so we would have uh, a, a, quote, uh, fluidic connection between a heart and a kidney and a lung, et cetera to replicate at least parts of the human body from an individual patient because you're using stem cells from that patient. Uh, the general terminology evolved as to microphysiology systems, MPS. Okay. The concept being these are small. They're all kind of these chips are usually the size of a microscope slide or maybe two or three times bigger than that, depending on how many organs are connected. And uh, over the last decade, I would say that it's been truly remarkable how much progress has been made in recapitulating not only functioning livers or kidneys uh, in vitro, but creating disease models within those uh, chips that you can then uh, test drugs in to see how would that patient's biomimetic twin respond. Uh, one of the things, an example is something we've been working on, it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's a disease that affects about 25% of the world population, and patients at differing rates and extents can go from just having a so-called fatty liver to having uh, an immune response in their livers that cause damage, and then that induces fibrosis, and you can go on to cirrhosis, which is an end-stage disease where you must get a liver transplant. Even some patients go on to get hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. So uh, the pharmaceutical industry has spent billions of dollars over the last decade trying to find drugs that would treat NAFLD, uh, and they've all failed to meet their endpoints. We believe it's because of the heterogeneity between patients, because they've had some success with a given drug on a subset of patients, but they don't reach a high enough percentage for the FDA to approve. So one goal is to say we're not going to get a random population of patients uh, for a particular drug trial, but we're going to find patients through their chips, in this case a liver chip, and ask the question, what's the probability that patient will respond to our drug? And if it looks promising in the chip, 
then you can enroll that patient in that clinical trial. This should increase uh, the probability of success for any given drug. Uh, and that's work that's actually in progress at this point. So I want to I'm, I'm going to try to say it back to you just to make sure that I'm understanding that correctly. So embedded in any stem cell, uh, you know, the, the reason that that's such a high potential um, cell to be acquiring is literally the code that says this is how we're going to build our liver, this is how we're going to build our heart, this is how we're going to build our organ. What and have build you? Build my liver or your liver? Exactly. That's this the- this specific <clears throat> organism's yeah. specific organ, and because of that code. The Human Genome Project, learning how to actually read that code, you can create a more or less a di- digital replica on this chip of that specific person's organ. And because we have now legibility into all of the qualities, the size, the, the minutia, the certain responses and, and tendencies towards different um, characteristics, the ability to digitize that information has never, ever been accomplishable in human history. So right now, at this point in time that we're privileged to live in, we sit at a time where that is a, a capability to digitize that information and the implications of these types of precision medicines and just general legibility to the wider world where you might not even know, despite that you're building the technology that allows the liver to be digitized, you don't even know that so-and-so over in whatever university is trying to run this specific study on this specific piece, but you've made it legible and those two things end up getting connected. Correct. Wow. So we, we take the, the, all the data we can get from the patient. We also take some of their stem cells and build sets of organs because from the stem cells, you can build by just directing its evolution uh, different types of cells, cardiac cells for the heart and hepatocytes from the liver. So you can build any organ from those same cells and you can actually store those cells. You can freeze them down and patient X, five years from now, we could bring those stem cells out if they get a disease and we want to replicate yeah. with their cells, uh, then we can build it and do testing there as well as taking the data from the patient itself. It, it is a game changer. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like it. And I, I'm sure that there's a, a subtleties and nuances as to what you're saying that's going over my head. But um, I, I want to talk just a little bit more about these these twins and what that means for the future of clinical care. So there's kind of this, you know, once again, I don't know from personal experience, but you watch, uh, you know, a show like House and you see that, you know, the doctors more or less putting their heads together, talking through all of the the, all of the data points that they've collected through anecdote, through reading the charts, through the tests, and trying to make sense of it. Basically, your kind of vision for the future is, yes, maybe those multitude of doctors come together to, to discuss all this, but there's also, uh, you know, if it's biocystics itself or some form of a report yeah. that's basically saying, we've run this number on the, yeah. the patient's liver condition, and this is what seems like the probabilistically highest yeah. uh, probability of success. And, and that is kind of bringing all of that complexity together in a computational model uh, that is uh, easy to test. You know, again, like changing the angle and the thrust on the rocket, you can say, well, if we do this and we do that, what does the model predict will occur? And that information can guide the physicians in making a decision. It's not automatic, uh, but it's another powerful piece to add to the ability to make the best decisions for a given patient. So going back a couple questions ago, you talked about the integration of all this data. So if we're talking about wearables, let's say I'm you know using an Apple Watch. If we're talking about my medical records, I know that there's uh, a couple big you know Mac daddies in that sp- particular field. There is a, a, an inherent kind of incentive to make yourself more important by kind of protecting your data to some degree, or being very judicious about what is actually made into a public API that can be called upon by third parties. So how do you think about attacking the problem of making all these enormously valuable pools of data start to work together? Yeah, that's a great question. (laughs) And quite frankly, I haven't thought about that deeply at this point because we're still trying to pull the technologies together to make it work. But it is a major challenge. Um, My guess is, since uh, at least we believe this will have a major impact on healthcare, uh, 
yeah. in terms of costs and patient responses and uh, 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 successes that some uh, uh, legislation is probably going to have to come forward on how this data is uh, protected and used where people that develop key algorithms, uh, et cetera, might have some protection. But on the other hand, the outcome has to be uh, focused on the patient. Uh, it's going to be a challenge for ethicists and uh, government officials uh, uh, combined. Yeah. And I guess it also, it, it, not that you build exclusively with like the acquisition in mind, particularly in this stage, but at, at some point, the the core effort of the company at this stage in time is to prove that the technology works, to take technical risk off the table. And then if there's some sort of much larger company that has the scale, the platform, the relationships, the leverage on the market, they could say, hey, we'd like to pull this up, integrate this into one of the things that we're building and be a part of that macro solution. And so the way we're addressing that is we have a great team here at the University of Pittsburgh and University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Uh, faculty that we're collaborating uh, with on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, both in the clinic as well as the stem cell biology and these uh, uh, chip technologies, as well as the computational tools. So we haven't uh, uh, formalized that attack yet, but there's a high probability we're going to use our strength in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and the overall strength in liver diseases at the University of Pittsburgh uh, to do a trial. Uh, and so we'll take one disease area with a patient population that we can access and give this a test. Very exciting. Um well, Lance, this has been fantastic. We're, we're kind of aiming towards our time limit here. Um, anything else that you wanted to share in general about precision medicine that I didn't give you a chance to? Um, I think uh, the timing is going to be longer than <clears throat> we or anyone else would like. But I think we'll see ma a major impact in the long-term patient digital twins within a decade some of the important components like uh, precision pathology are occurring now and will have a big impact over the next couple of years. So in our mind, as we've spun off companies, Spintelex we see as a near-term impact with its advanced technologies in machine learning and explainable AI. Uh, Biosystics and the whole patient digital twins is out further. Yeah. So, but I think the uh, potential is huge uh, and will occur. I can't pick the exact date, but it will occur. Yeah. Well, it uh, it brings to mind some genuine kind of sci-fi to think about, you know, the doctor putting up on a screen, not just like the representation of a human body, but literally like this is how we're modeling your heart, your liver and what's going on. And here's how we're thinking about uh, treating it. So it's inspiring, very exciting. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk us through all that. Uh, if folks want to learn more about your companies, about you, uh, where should we point them in the digital world? So, uh, spintelex.com uh, uh, is a, a website for the precision pathology company, and I think there's a good summary of where we are and what we're trying to accomplish there. The same thing with biosystics, uh, biosystics.com. There's general information available. For the Drug Discovery Institute, uh, uh, there is a, a site, uh, updi.pit.edu, which kind of tells the story of how we're using a combination of computational approaches and exper advanced experimental approaches to study a variety of diseases. Beautiful. We're going to link all that in the show notes. You can find it in the app where you're probably listening to this right now or at goingdeepthern.com slash podcast for every single episode of the show. But Lance, before we let you go, I would like to give you the mic one final time to issue an actionable personal challenge for the audience. Well, I think um, uh, healthcare is obviously a major concern for every person in the world, let alone this country. Uh, it's too expensive. It's not exact enough yet. Uh, there's still a lot of patient uh, pain based on not getting the right treatment at the right time for their particular disease. 
I think we're within a decade of making a major transformation of healthcare. So I would challenge people, uh, continue encouraging your government officials to support basic biomedical research and uh, the translation of that basic work into companies that then can come together to uh, yield the major solution within the decade. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to see what the decade holds. I'm excited to see what the future holds for you and your companies. And uh, once again, appreciate you going deep with us today. Thanks for talking with me. Thanks for listening out there. I hope everyone out there has a fantastic day. Hey, thanks for watching to the end of my interview with Dr. Taylor. If you enjoyed it, you would also enjoy our past interview with Dr. Gordon Vanskoy, where we talk about his firm, Panther Rare Pharmaceuticals. In addition to being a billion dollar biotech unicorn, we get into the details of treating rare diseases and supporting the small pharmaceutical upstarts that serve those patients. Check it out.